When you think about it, the tank is truly a hateful contraption. It is a machine with a single purpose, to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible in the most destructive way possible. And yet despite this, something about the tank is undeniably mesmerizing. Ask any group of men in the land to name their favorite tank and the scene around you will immediately derail with fierce debates as long-held convictions spring to the surface and their proponents demand vindication. If you happen to be one of these people with a deep-seated interest in tanks, then, well, we've got a bit of a treat for you today. Because over the next hour or so, we're going to explore the complete history of the tank, from its earliest origins through to the present day, and even what the future might hold. So strap yourself in, get comfy, this is a long one. The idea of a tank is much older than you might first imagine. With boffins of old long having dreamt of such machines even before the technology to produce them was even on the horizon. An early example comes from none other than Leonardo da Vinci, who sketched a design for a tank of sorts all the way back in 1487. This unnamed design, referred to as Leonardo's fighting vehicle by historians, featured a turtle shell inspired conical wooden cover reinforced with metal. Internally, it was powered by two large person-pushed cranks and armed with a series of light cannons positioned around its edge. Most believe the machine was never built, as the crank gearing would be non-functional if built as drawn, and the sheer weight of the thing would be impossible for all but the most absolute units to move. Another example comes from prolific British science fiction writer H. G. Wells, who in his 1903 story The Land Ironclads introduced the titular machines. Mechanical behemoths with robust, narrow steel frames supported by eight pairs of massive wheels, a design meant to not only afford them impressive stability, but also allow for intricate maneuvering on the battlefield. They were also described as being encased in adjustable iron plating, complete with strategically placed lookout points and a central conning tower that the captain could raise or lower as needed. Inside, riflemen were stationed in cabins along the framework, operating semi-automatic rifles with mechanical targeting capabilities. As time progressed, technological advancements such as the internal combustion engine and the continuous track began to bridge the gap between these fantastical imaginations and reality. And, well, soon enough clever sorts began working to combine them all into functional military machines that would bring the dreams of da Vinci and Wells to life. The first was Austrian officer Gunther Burstein, who designed what he dubbed the Motor Geschutz in 1911. This featured a fully rotating turret atop caterpillar tracks. There was also Australian engineer Lancelot de Mole, who designed the catchily named chainrail vehicle which could be easily steered and carry heavy loads over rough grounds and trenches. Bit for mouthful, in 1912. This was a tracked, cigar-shaped vehicle equipped with internal weaponry and was designed to cross trenches and rough terrain. Though pioneering, both designs never left the drawing board. As far as the conservative military hierarchies of their respective nations were concerned, such machines were naught but boondoggles. After all, when would they possibly have need of a heavily armored vehicle that could take a licking and give out a kicking while crossing rough terrain with ease? Who would need that? I need it now, not later. No. Just before we continue with today's video, I do want to talk about something a bit personal, and that is hair loss. Now, as you can see, I've had to embrace the bald look. Keeps can't save my level of hair loss. It was too late for me. If Keeps was around 10 years earlier than it was, I'd have been on it. But look, if you've still got hair and you're beginning to lose it, Keeps can help you out. They're an online subscription service that is changing the game for men dealing with male pattern baldness. Keeps is super convenient, no more awkward trips to the doctor's office or the pharmacy, just get expert care from the comfort of your own home. And the best part, it comes in discreet packaging, no one needs to know about your path to luscious locks. So what's cool is that Keeps tailors a treatment plan just for you. It's like having your own hair guardian angel, and guess what? It's not going to break the bank. Keeps treatments are typically half the cost of traditional pharmacy prices. Affordable 
and effective, it's a great combo. Keeps offers clinically proven treatments. According to studies, these treatments are 90% effective at treating hair loss and can increase hair growth by up to 35%. Plus, they have a fantastic two-in-one gel available. And for those of you wondering, Keeps is trusted by almost a million men. That's a lot of satisfied customers with over 4,500 five-star reviews. So here's the deal. Hair loss stops with Keeps. And I've got a special offer for you. Just go to keeps.com forward slash Simon or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Simon, your journey to great hair starts there. There's a link below. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring. And now back to today's video. Not even two years later, World War I broke out. And with it, an uninterrupted line of trenches began to spread from the Swiss Alps to the French coast, creating a need for a heavily armored vehicle that could take a licking while giving a kicking while crossing rough terrain with ease. If only someone had imagined such a machine was possible. The British military, in response to this situation, did what it always did when facing overwhelming odds. Continued sending hordes of young men to suffer pointless and violent deaths in far-off foreign fields as boffins back in Blighty desperately attempted to Wallace and Gromit their way out of the situation through the creation of wacky and wondrous machines. Now, if you're wondering why De Moore hadn't reappeared yet, well, that's a good question. He did make a request to assist the War Department once World War I kicked off, but nothing ever came of it. Some say his request simply got lost in bureaucracy. Others say that the elitist British military hierarchy jowls or waving with the kind of vigor that only comes from multiple generations of aristocratic inbreeding simply refused to entertain the idea of a colonial country bumpkin ever being able to come up with anything good. Whatever the reason, he would play no part in British tank developments. British R&D efforts were quick to yield results, though, and in September 1915, Little Willie. <laughs> really? <laughs> the world's first tank rolled out of the factory. It was a simple thing, basically a pair of extended commercially available track assemblies with an armored box riveted between them. It was also unarmed, but this was fine because Little Willie wasn't meant to be shipped out to the front lines. It was simply a proof of concept intended to test trench crossing capabilities. These tests actually went much worse than many lazy coffee table histories would tell you, as Little Willie had a habit of getting stuck in the mud, its protruding front coming to rest on the edge of trenches and preventing the tracks from getting traction. But crucially, the tests did show promise. A bit of tinkering here and a little bit of tinkering there stopped Little Willie getting stuck in the mud and, well, with that, they might have been on to a winner. Oh, and because many of you might be wondering why was Little Willie called Little Willie, it was given that name to mark Kaiser Wilhelm II. And yes, that joke was absolutely made at the time, too. The focus then shifted to transforming Little Willie into a combat-ready machine, the result of which was the Mark I. It was equipped with 11.9mm of armor plating and featured an array of weapons, two 57mm QF six-pounder cannons on the male version and four machine guns on the female version, all of which sat in side-mounted sponsors. And do note here in British nomenclature, an X pounder refers to the weight of the projectile that comes out of the business end. The most notable difference between Little Willie and the Mark I, however, was the complete redesign of the tracks, which on the Mark I took on the rhomboid shape that British tanks of this period are so iconic for. The rationale behind this choice was pretty clever. With the tracks always being on the outermost edge of the tank, it was significantly harder for it to get stuck, as they would always be making contact and hopefully be able to pull it out of whatever predicament it got itself into. With the Mark I design finalized, the demonstration was held in February 1916 with Big Willy, the first Mark I complete. <laughs> Sorry. The first Mark I completed taking center stage. The aim of these tests was simple, to wow political and military bigwigs and win their support for the continued deployment of tanks. Among the attendees were Lord Kitchener, the Secretary of State of War, David Lloyd George, the Minister of Munitions, and Reginald McKenna, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Despite his cumbersome appearance, Big Willie impressed navigating the network of trenches and challenging terrain laid out for it with ease. And because politicians were just as fickle then as they are now, the organizers made sure that some targets were available at the end to be blown up, reasoning that a little fireworks display would hardly hurt their chances. Despite the big shiny explosions, however, Lord Kitchener was not impressed, dismissing tanks as mechanical toys. His mind was a conservative one, one in which the British Empire had grown great without any of these newfangled contraptions, so why should they need it now, damn it? In contrast, Lloyd George and McKenna were more open-minded, 
Both already had a reputation for supporting innovative military strategies and technologies, and thus immediately recognized the tank's revolutionary potential. An order of a hundred Mark Ones was placed before the day was out. Eager to keep the Central Powers ignorant, the program was deemed top secret, with information being on a need-to-know basis. So secret was development that even many of the workers involved in the construction didn't know what they were building, being told they were building mobile water tanks for desert warfare, which is actually where we get the word tank from today. For some reason, that just stuck. The next step was to give the tank its trial by far, deployment in real combat. That would come on September 15, 1916, the first day of the Battle of fleur coulisse itself part of the large Battle of the Somme. 49 Mark Ones were deployed, 17 males, 32 females. But before the first shot of the battle had been fired, the British were down 17 tanks through a combination of mechanical breakdown and becoming stuck. Real war, it appeared, would be just a bit harder than anyone might have imagined. As the attack commenced, the 32 operational tanks crawled forward. With tank tactics being non-existent, they were deployed in the manner that seemed most logical, spread out broadly. Initially, things went well. One tank managed to instill such terror that the first line of defending Germans completely routed and abandoned their posts, thus allowing the first trench line to be secured with minimal casualties. But shortly after that initial success, the tank broke down, and the Germans in the second line emptied everything they had into it, completely blowing the tank apart under a hail of machine gun, grenade, and artillery fire. Elsewhere, another tank shared the same so-so results. Advancing in the immediate aftermath of a creeping artillery barrage, the tank and its supporting infantry had great initial success, easily sweeping aside the first line of German defenders. From here, the attack stalled, though. A counter-artillery barrage was luckily dodged by the tank, and it maintained a stationary position as it returned the favor into the German lines. But then, nothing. No further ground was gained, and the tank soon found itself immobilized. The crew then continued to use the wrecked tank as a pillbox, discharging their small arms out of the windows and hatches when the cannons run out of ammo. Eventually, after five hours of this, the tank caught fire, and the crew were forced to abandon it. These two tales exemplify the tank's early battle performance. It was promising. No more, no less. But it had displayed just enough merit to warrant the continued development, and so the British continued developing. Next came the Mark II and the Mark III. These were only neutered training variants, so we're not going to spend too much time on them. But the Mark IV, while well, that is of interest to us, as it was the next variant of tank that actually was intended for combat. Introduced in 1917, it was a culmination of lessons learned up to that point, and it boasted substantial improvements in armor. It also incorporated a hull-mounted Lewis machine gun, which afforded it a greater defense against attacking infantry. It had also been planned to give it a new engine and transmission, but this couldn't be figured out in time, leading to it keeping the same engine from the Mark I, and thus being able to top out at an absolutely whopping 4 miles an hour. 1,220 Mark IVs were produced, just under half the total British tank production in the war, and after making its combat debut at the Battle of Messines Ridge in June 1917, it remained the standard British tank for the rest of the war. From time to time, the British would sway from the tried and tested rhomboid death machine formula and experiment with new types of tanks, with a notable example being the Whippet. Formerly known as the Medium Mark A, the Whippet was an entirely different type of tank, one designed to be faster and more agile so that it could zoom around the battlefield and exploit gaps in the line. For this purpose, it was given two engines and thinner armor, a combination that dragged the 14-ton tank up to a top speed of 8 miles per hour. The heavy cannons were also dropped in favor of an all-machine gun layout to save weight further. Then there was the Mark IX. It may look like a Mark IV that's been run through a mangle, but don't be fooled by the similarities. This was a machine built for a very different purpose. It was an armored personnel carrier, a machine intended to use all the armored goodness of the tank to deliver troops to the front line in safety. To make space for the troops, of which 30 could fit inside, the sponsons were dropped altogether, and the Mark IX's sole means of attack came from two machine guns at the front and up to 16 of its men's rifles, which could be poked out of the side through handy firing ports. Both the Whippet and the Mark IX are very important to the story of the tank. Why? Well, that's because they represent the British starting to think proactively about how tanks should actually be used on the battlefield. They are the beginning of the end of the tank as a big shooty bang bang box which makes war go gooder, and the start of the tank's era as a refined, sophisticated, and intelligently deployed battlefield implement. 
any history of the tank in World War I is going to focus predominantly on the British. It was, after all, their invention. But they were far from the only nation to produce them during the conflict. So now, let's take the time to look at the efforts of some other nations, starting with France. Their first tank, the Schneider CA-1, was developed in 1916 and first deployed in 1917. It was a bit of a cobbled together thing, being hastily designed after the French were made aware of the British tank program and found themselves fancying a bit of that for themselves. Rather than the completely original designs used by the British, it was, in essence, a halt tractor with an armored box and some guns plonked on top. All in all, it was okay, given its rush development, and it just about worked, but it suffered from the same ability issues as Little Willy and had a nasty habit of setting itself on fire. France's next tank, the saint chamond was in many ways a parallel of the CA-1, having been developed in 1916 and first deployed in 1917, and being more or less a halt tractor with some bits plonked on top. But whereas the CA-1 was okay, given its rush development, the saint chamond was an absolute sack of various uh, YouTube demonetizable words. If Little Willy and CA-1 had issues getting stuck, the Sachemont and its enormous overhang that had a three-ton gun stuffed inside of it took the issue to a whole other level. In practical terms, it couldn't cross trenches. Period. The second its tracks started to creep over a trench, that enormous counterweight in the front would simply pull it down, at which point it would only present a danger to the enemy if they happened to die from laughter. But. Then we have the Renault FT, the absolute unit, the OG, the creme de la creme. It represented radical departure from previous models, as it was built entirely from the ground up, rather than being bodged together from whatever machinery French industry happened to have lying around. It was compact, agile, weighing just six tons, and featured a revolutionary fully rotating turret, a design element that remains standard in tanks to this day. Introduced in 1917, it quickly demonstrated its superiority on the battlefield, showcasing impressive maneuverability and reliability compared to its predecessors. It was armed with either a 37mm SA-18 cannon or with a machine gun, and it was protected by decently thick armor, providing a balance of firepower and protection. It was hands down France's best tank of the war, and arguably the best tank of the war, period. And if nothing else, it proved that when the French actually bothered to do it properly, they could make a damn fine tank. Then there was Italy, whose foray into tank development during World War I was relatively limited compared to the major powers, as they only produced one tank model, the Fiat 2000. This massive vehicle, weighing around 40 tons, was among the largest tanks of its time, featuring a 65mm Modelo 13 cannon and up to seven machine guns. However, its size and weight also meant that it was exceedingly slow, with a top speed of just three miles per hour. The Fiat 2000 never saw combat, with the two prototypes being completed far too late to be used. Despite this, historians hold it in high regard and believe that it could have been one of the best tanks of the war had it entered production, leading some to dub it the tank that got away. And then there was Germany, who neglected tank development throughout the war and only produced 20 examples of a single tank, the A7V. This was a boxy, cumbersome thing, armed with a 57mm Maxim Nordenfeld cannon borrowed from the artillery corps and six machine guns. It weighed around 33 tons, and it maxed out at around 4 miles per hour, making it neither nimble nor quick. Its crew of up to 18 men found the interior cramped and the conditions inside intolerable, with the engine's heat and exhaust fumes creating a stifling environment. Furthermore, it had significant operational limitations. It struggled with rough terrain and was notoriously unreliable with a high breakdown rate. It saw limited action and only participated in a handful of engagements in 1918, but one of these, the Second Battle of Villiers Bretonneau, is very interesting indeed, as it featured the first tank on tank engagement in history. The battle occurred between the 24th and the 25th of April 1918, and it started when German forces launched a surprise attack in an attempt to reverse their rapidly deteriorating fortunes. They soon seized the village of Villiers Bretonneau itself, in response to which the British dispatched three Mark IVs, one male, two female, to nip the advance in the bud. During their advance, they crossed paths with an A7V, dubbed Nixie by its crew. Nixie immediately opened fire on the female tanks, causing severe damage and forcing both of them to retreat as their machine guns could barely scratch the A7V. This left just the male Mark IV and Nixie to duel one another, and the pair began swapping shots, all while they both dodged artillery fire. The Mark IV eventually halted to allow its gunner a more stable shooting position, resulting in three successful hits on the Nixie. This resulted in it being blown onto its side and taken out of the fight. 
Almost immediately after, the Mark IV faced another threat as two more A7Vs supported by infantry appeared on the scene. But quick thinking led to the British tank emptying everything it had into the A7Vs at range, which put the frighteners up the German crews enough that both tanks retreated. And, well, that brings us to the end of World War I. Tanks were now in the later stages of their infancy, their effectiveness having been proven, but their technologies and tactics still being rather crude and primitive. Now, this would change during the interwar period, when the refinement of both of those things would lead to the world having an array of tanks and a wealth of ideas about how to best utilize them, some of which would be terrible and some of which would be terrific. So now, let's bring this chapter to a close and have a look at what happened, shall we? Now let's begin by looking at the myriad of tank classifications that either appeared or were refined during this period. The first of these is the tankette. Characterized by their compact size, to many they are a tank only by technicality. They typically had minimal armor and were armed with machine guns or very small caliber cannons. Tankettes were often crewed by just one or two personnel and were initially valued for their mobility and ease of production. Notable examples include the British Card and Lloyd tank. It was armed with only a single machine gun and it became a widely influential design and was used as a basis for similar vehicles in other countries. The Italian CV-33 and CV-35 series, known for their operational use in Italy's clone your wars and later in World War II were also significant. Like the Card and Lloyd, it was armed with just a single machine gun. And then there was the Japanese Type 94 tankette, which saw extensive action in China, serving primarily as a reconnaissance vehicle and a portable machine gun post with its single machine gun. There was also the Polish TKS, which usually came with a single gun, but broke the mold by also sometimes being fitted with a 20mm WZ-38 autocannon. Now, despite their initial appeal, tankettes ultimately proved to be a bit inadequate. Their small size and light armor, while advantageous, left them extremely vulnerable to enemy fire. Infantry rifles would typically penetrate them with ease, and a 50 cal would tear them to shreds. Their modest armaments also limited their offensive capabilities, especially against fortified positions or enemy armor, against which they were about as much use as a chocolate teapot. Their cramped interiors also made them uncomfortable, and they were typically despised by their their crews. Despite these glaring flaws, they persisted on for most of the interwar period, with the world's military lacking a suitably big war to wake them up to whatever useless death traps they were. Next came the light tanks, tracing their roots back to the nippy FT of World War I. These tanks were designed to zoom around the battlefield at a rapid pace while still having enough firepower to ruin another tank's day and enough armor to take a bit of a kicking, but note that this armor was typically a secondary defense. Speed was the main way that these tanks stayed alive. Their firepower usually came from cannons ranging from 20 to 45 millimeters in size, but some also had pure machine gun layouts. Countries across the world experimented with light tanks, with each of them putting their own spin on the general parameters that we just outlined. A British example would be the Vickers light tank. Light by name and nature, it could reach speeds of 35 miles per hour and had just about enough armor to shake off machine gun fire. The British never intended it to face off against armor or fortified positions and instead envisioned it primarily as a reconnaissance vehicle and thus equipped it with a 50 cal machine gun, enough to tear up infantry and soft targets quite happily. A Soviet example would be the BT-7. This took the light tank concept to its ultimate extreme. Wafer-thin armor that any absolute units in the audience could probably bend with a hard stomp, a ludicrous top speed of 53 miles per hour, and a 45mm cannon, more than enough to handle most tanks of its period. Known by the Soviets as a cavalry tank, it was designed to fight just like the cavalry of old. Zoom in, mess up and get back ASAP. Light tanks such as these were perfectly agreeable in this period. Big, scary tanks were few and far between, and their guns were usually perfectly adequate against other light and even medium tanks. They were also generally excellent against infantry thanks to their ability to perform high-speed flanking maneuvers and proved flexible as the generals of the period tinkered and tried new ideas for warfighting. Following the light tanks, with the medium tanks. These offered a balance between the mobility of light tanks and the far power and armor of heavier types. They were often the backbone of armored forces in the period and were designed to fulfill a range of roles on the battlefield, from direct combat engagements to supporting infantry. A classic example of an interwar medium tank would be the Soviet T-28. Designed in the 1930s, it featured a multi-turreted design housing a 76.2mm M1927 cannon in a large main turret and machine guns in smaller secondary turrets. 
Although it maxed out at 22 miles per hour, it was considered relatively fast for its size and era. The T-28's armor, while not exceptionally thick, provided adequate protection against the crude anti-tank weapons of the time. Its primary role was to support infantry and break through the fortified lines, hence the multi-turret design. It was meant to smash over trenches and through fortifications while dealing out death in three separately aimable arcs of fire. It was typically liked by its crews, but it was a complicated and challenging beast to maintain and thus was typically hated by its commanders. Another medium tank of note is the French Samoa S-35. Developed in the 1930s, it had robust and well-designed armor, featuring a cast hull that offered better protection than the riveted hulls that were in vogue at the time. Armed with a 47mm SA-35 gun, the S-35 was more than capable of engaging enemy armor and fortifications alike. Its top speed of around 25 miles per hour made it relatively fast, allowing for effective maneuvering on the battlefield. The S-35 has featured a one-man turret. This has been intended as a cost-saving measure, but in reality, it proved to be a huge flaw, as the commander found himself having to fire the gun, reload the gun, and spot all at the same time, all roles which were assigned individually in larger turrets, such as that on the T-28. Despite this flaw, however, its mix of firepower, mobility, and armor still made it one of the most formidable tanks of the period. After the medium tanks, of course, came the heavy tanks, tanks that maximized firepower and armor protection at the expense of speed. These formidable machines were designed to be the battering rams of the battlefield, capable of enduring and inflicting substantial damage. The French Char B1 is a prime example of such a tank. Introduced in the mid-1930s, it had impressive armor and a dual weapon system featuring a 75mm SA-35 cannon in the hull and a 47mm SA-34 cannon in the turret. This powerful combination allowed it to happily engage both fortifications and enemy armor. Like the S-35, however, the B-1 was blighted by crew overburdening. It had the same turret issues as its medium brother, and additionally, the driver also had to aim and fire the hull cannon. Another significant heavy tank of this era was the Soviet T-35. A monster on the battlefield, the T-35 is notable for featuring five turrets, within which it carried a 76mm M1927 cannon, two secondary 45mm 20K cannons, and up to seven machine guns. This multi-turreted approach was intended to allow the T-35 to function as a land battleship, spewing out death and destruction in an apocalyptic manner as it trundled along the battlefield. Unfortunately for the Soviets, this turned out to be a thoroughly stupid idea, with the T-35 proving to be about as much use as an adult magazine in a nunnery. The sheer weight of these turrets led to the T-35 armor being radically cut back to save weight so they could actually, you know, move. And as a result, parts of its armor were thinner than that of the BT-7. This in a tank that screamed, shoot me first or you're going home in a bin bag. They did at least have a decent top speed of 19 miles per hour, when it worked, which it often didn't. Besides the types that we've already covered thus far, a myriad of others appeared or were refined in this period. We're going to quickly go over them now so you're aware, but as they were typically produced in small numbers, we're not going to dwell a whole bunch on them. There were flame tanks, which were equipped with flamethrowers instead of traditional weapons. These were mainly used for infantry support and clearing fortifications. A notable example is the Soviet KH-T-26, which was based on a T-26 medium tank. Then there's assault guns like the Soviet Su-5-1. These were essentially turretless tanks with a fixed gun intended to provide direct fire support for infantry. Then there's self-propelled anti-aircraft weapons such as the British Birch Gun, which were created by mounting anti-aircraft guns on tank chassis to protect ground forces from aerial attacks. For the Birch, an 84mm Ordnance QF-18 pounder was mounted to the chassis of a Vickers Medium Mark II. Then there's self-propelled artillery, such as the Soviet Su-8, which featured large caliber artillery guns on the tank chassis, providing mobile artillery support. For the Su-8, it was the 152mm ML-20 howitzer mounted to a T-28 chassis. And lastly, super-heavy tanks were enormous tanks with thick armor and large guns. These were intended to be the ultimate weapon against four fortifications and other tanks, but they often proved impractical due to their size and weight. The French Char 2C is one of the few examples of such a tank from the interwar period. And note that the terms that we've used thus far are general terms used by historians and some contemporary militaries to describe tanks, but individual militaries often developed their own specific designations that reflected their unique doctrines and intended use of their tanks. 
For instance, the British Army distinguished between infantry and cruiser tanks, both of which would fit within the medium category. Infantry tanks like the Matilda 1 and 2 were heavily armored tanks designed to crawl along the battlefield at a walking pace, soaking up enemy fire and taking the stress off the infantry as they went. Cruiser tanks such as the A-13 were fast and lightly armed, designed to act as modern cavalry in much the same manner that we've already described with BT-7. Now, if all of this sounds a bit eclectic to you, don't worry, because in this period, to be blunt, tank designers were flinging dung and seeing what stuck. Tanks were so new, and big wars to really test them out so few and far between, that norms and values for their use had yet to be established. And thus, the myriad of designs we just discussed, many of which at best seem a bit wacky or at worst downright bizarre to our modern eyes, were born. Everyone knew that tanks were going to be a big deal in the next war, they just had no idea in what form, so they resulted in doing the only thing they could do, taking a bit of a stab in the dark. Now, further complicating this was the technological advancements of the period. These allowed for more powerful engines, better and thicker armor, and more powerful and versatile guns. But how to incorporate all of this? They simply didn't know, and each new technological improvement took them further and further from the tried and tested designs of World War I and deeper into ignorance and speculation. To explain this further, let's look once more at the T-35. With its five turrets and a wafer-thin armor, it's a design that almost is laughable to our modern eyes. But how are its designers going to know any better? The logic is there. Lots of guns, lots of death dealing, a real land battleship is brilliant. And the designers simply couldn't be expected to know that when World War II came, it would prove to be a joke of a tank that would also prove to be about as much use as an ice salesman in Antarctica. We only advance by standing on the shoulders of giants, and tank design is no different. Supplementary to this ignorance was economic constraints as a driver of design particularly during the Great Depression. Every country on Earth would have had some clever swords capable of designing revolutionary tanks, but who's going to pay for it, particularly when the economy is in turmoil and there weren't exactly any big wars going on? This led to a slew of promising designs being cancelled and intelligently designed machines being cut to ribbons by the most terrifying opponent a military can face a bureaucrat on a mission to save money. Exampling this is the medium Soviet T-26, which was adopted entirely because it was cheap. Despite being one of the Soviet's best tanks of the period, largely reliable, decent armor, fairly nippy, and a more than adequate 45mm 20k cannon, it was a tank that got little love from the Soviet military elite. It was intended as a bodge, a stopgap, a it'll do tank, a, a British Vickers six time that they tinkered with to make it more to their liking and then churned out en masse. Like a flawed and troubled marriage, the T-26 was the girl the Soviets settled for, all the while they dreamt of a future with T-35s. Despite the relative calm of this interwar period, tanks did still see combat here and there. So now, let's see how they got on, beginning with the Spanish Civil War. On the nationalist side, German and Italian tanks proved crucial. The Germans provided the Panzer I, an all-machine-gun light tank that was primarily intended for training, but was pressed into combat anyway because, well, why not? They had loads at the minute. And it's not like it'd be their lads dying inside of them if it went the wrong way. The Italian contribution mainly consisted of CV-33 and CV-35 tankettes, and they performed about as badly as you might expect. The Republican forces, on the other hand, primarily relied on Soviet tanks, with the T-26 and BT-5, the BT-7's older brother, being the most significant. These proved more capable than the German and Italian tanks, both having 45mm cannons compared to the pure machine gun layouts of their opponents. These were supplied as part of the Soviet support for the Republican government, along with training and technical assistance at face value anyway. In reality, while the Soviets were keen to help, they really just wanted some feedback about how their tanks performed in combat. All in all, the tank's performance in the conflict was a bit of a mixed bag, much like in World War I. When used right, they proved to be decisive weapons. But several still present flaws in their design and deployment demonstrated that the tank still had a long way to go. For example, at the Battle of Brunette in July 1937, Republican forces, bolstered by their Soviet-supplied tanks, launched a major offensive to relieve the pressure on Madrid. The Nationalists lacked any tanks of their own or meaningful anti-tank weapons that they could counter with, so Republican T-26s made devastating initial progress. But then they went too far. Their fuel tanks started to run low, and unable to be supplied with any more fuel thanks to the poor state of Republican logistics, their path of destruction reached its end. Now static, they were easily picked off by the Nationalist artillery, and the few that could called it a day 
and retreated. And then there was the Battle of Teruel, which occurred from December 1937 to February 1938. This battle saw heavy use of tanks by both sides in a grueling winter campaign. Here, their effectiveness was nothing like at Brunette, because between the enemy tanks that could meet them on an equal footing and the much less favorable weather conditions of winter, both tank forces faltered and proved incapable of making any meaningful breakthrough. The odd time the opposing tanks actually met each other, it was typically an easy victory for the Soviet tanks. The T-26 and the BT-5's 45mm cannons made easy work of the meager challenges sent their way by the nationalists. These, with their pure machine gun layouts, could just about manage to blow a track if they were lucky, but that's it. But it wasn't all bad for the nationalists. Their tanks might have been useless in a stand-up fight, but in a typical engagement where they wouldn't be encountering the enemy armor, they performed perfectly adequately and handled enemy infantry and unarmored vehicles with ease. The Panzer I also proved surprisingly easy to maintain, ensuring that it had a high state of readiness, a critically important factor in a tank's effectiveness. Above all else, conflicts such as the Spanish Civil War proved that armored warfare had come a long way since the days of World War I. Tanks were now stronger, faster, and more versatile than ever, able to be deployed in manners that would have been the preserve of science fiction back in the days of the trenches. Crucially, however, they also proved that the tank still had a long way to go. If badly designed, like the tankettes, they were only useful with a major fluke of fate. If not given proper logistical support, like the T-26s of Brunette, their effectiveness would be cut to near nil. And just like a saint chamond of old, desperately trying to scramble its way out of a slightly deep puddle, they were still very susceptible to the weather, as demonstrated at Teruel. But as far as lessons go, the Spanish Civil War was but a prep school, because lingering just around the corner, a mere five months after its conclusion, was the next big war. The one that would plunge the world into chaos and spare no quarter to poorly designed and deployed tanks. As of course, World War II. In the story of the tank, World War II should be thought of as just one big testing ground. It was a conflict in which civilization itself was on the line, and thus every tank, good or bad, was sent to the front to do its part. In this mighty crucible, the wheat was split from the chaff. The poorly designed tanks fell by the wayside, sometimes taking an entire nation with them. And the good tanks while they rose to the top, mighty champions that would ensure not only their nation's survival, but its supremacy in the new world order. So now, flashy metaphors aside, and let's dive into a few of the major combatants from the conflict and see what the changes to their tank forces actually looks like. Starting with the Soviet Union. Now, we're all familiar with some of the tanks that the Soviet Union took into the war, having already met the T-26, the T-28, T-35, and the BT-5 and 7. These all participated in the nation's early campaigns, namely the Winter War and the Soviet invasion of Poland. But alongside them were a few more modern designs, such as the KV-1 heavy tank that managed to sneak onto the roster just before the onset of hostilities, and the T-34 that snuck on just after. The older tanks did not fare well at all. They just about managed to hold their own against the Finns and the Poles, whose tank forces and militaries overall were rather modest in the grand scheme of things. Become Operation Barbarossa, it was an absolute massacre, with German Panzer 3s and 4s armed with high-velocity 37mm KWK-36 and low-velocity 75mm KWK-37 cannons respectively, and much more modern designs overall going through them like tissue paper. The old tanks were also easy pickings for the Germans' other anti-tank solutions, Ju-87 dive bombers and towed guns such as the humble 37mm Pac-36 and mighty 88mm Flak alike, all racked up substantial kill counts picking off these obsolete tanks. The T-34 and KV-1, although plagued by reliability issues, both fared much better. The T-34 was quick and nimble, able to drive the advantage when small tactical level victories were won, and the KV-1 was able to take a kicking with the cannons of the Panzer III and IV finding it difficult to defeat its thick armor. Both were then equipped with the same 76mm F-34 cannon, a decent enough piece with a range of shells and velocity sufficient to defeat the vast bulk of the German tanks of this early war period. Eager to get the most out of the designs, the Soviets continued refining the T-34 and KV-1 throughout the war. 
Come the conflict's end, the original T-34, dubbed the T-3476 on account of its cannon size, had transformed into the T-3485 with the, you guessed it, 85mm cannon, specifically the ZIS-S-53. Crucially, they also worked tirelessly to improve quality control at the factories, meaning that those early reliability issues were largely solved. The KV-1 also underwent a similar transformation. There was the KV-1S, a variant with lighter armor and a beefier engine to favor mobility, and the KV-2, which whacked a whopping great 152mm M10T howitzer in a new and rather ridiculously proportioned turret. But the real revolution came with the IS series that debuted late war. To put it simply, stretch a KV lengthways a bit, thicken up its armor, stick a giant 122mm D25T cannon in the turret, and you had an IS. It was a real monster of a heavy tank. Germany's tanks underwent a similar transformation. We already know about their Panzer I, III, and IV, but alongside them, they also fielded Panzer IIs, somewhat refined light tanks that were armed with 20mm KWK-30 autocannons, and thus were actually capable of killing a tank from time to time. The Panzer III's were intended to be Germany's main anti-tank tank, and the Panzer IV's were intended as infantry support tanks, but often found themselves being pushed into the anti-tank role thanks to their large cannon. Supplementing this was an eclectic mix of foreign tanks that Germany took from subjugated nations and pushed into service themselves, everything from the diddly but surprisingly competent 37mm KWK 38T armored Czechoslovak Panzer 38T to the Shah B1. Like the Soviets, some of these were great, others flopped big time. The Panzer III and Panzer 38T proved satisfactory, but their cannons lacked punch against the bigger Soviet stuff. The Panzer I, and to a lesser extent the Panzer II, was a flop, being simply too thinly armored and weakly armed to be competitive, and the Panzer IV, with its thicker armor, decent gun, and relative zippiness, was a winner. Similarly, the Char B1, despite their quirky design, also proved decent enough thanks to its thick armor and two cannons. Like the Soviets, the Germans sought to discard their poor designs and make the most of their good ones. To this end, the Panzers I and II were promptly pulled from the front lines and relegated to safer anti-partisan and occupation roles, and the Panzer III's and IV's were upgraded with a 50mm KWK-38 and 75mm KWK-40 cannon respectively in 1942, which made them both significantly more competitive going forward. The Germans also bodged many of their smaller tanks to keep them viable. For example, some Panzer IIs were converted into Marder IIs by ripping off the turret and replacing them with thick 75mm Pac-40 cannons, and similarly some Panzer 38Ds uh, were turned into Marder IIs by replacing their turret with the same cannon arrangements. The Panzer 38T also served as the basis of the Jagst Panzer 38, a very competent late war design that incorporated a 75mm PAK-39 cannon and extensive sloped armor into its design. Like the Soviets with their IS series, the Germans also introduced advanced new designs as the war went on. Notable examples include the Panzer V Panther, a medium tank built as a direct response to the T-34 that incorporated heavily sloped armor, decent mobility, and a powerful 75mm cannon, and the Panzer VI Tiger, a heavy tank that utilized thick armor and a mighty 88mm cannon that was intended to defeat anything that the Allies might throw at it. And then there was the British, whose wartime transformation was guided by the same principles, but took on a different form. As rather than making what they had work and bringing in the odd new design here and there as the Germans and Soviets had, they ended the war with a completely different lineup of tanks than when they'd started. They started with models such as the Matilda 1 and 2 infantry tanks, Crusader cruiser tanks, and Vickers light tanks. And by the end of the war, these were replaced with the Churchill Infantry Tank, Cromwell Cruiser Tank, M3 Stuart Light Tank, and the M4 Sherman Medium Tank, just to name a few. These changes were influenced by a confluence of urgent necessity, practical limitations, and the evolving nature of armored warfare. The near total loss of Britain's armored forces in the Battle of France was a devastating blow that necessitated a comprehensive rebuilding effort. This situation provided the political capital and impetus needed to push through new tank designs, which might have been sidelined in favor of more tried and tested models under normal circumstances. The dire need for rapid replenishment of armor also meant that British factories were overwhelmed and couldn't keep up with demand, leading to the adoption of foreign designs, notably American tanks like the M3 Stuart and M4 Sherman. This was a pragmatic solution that also brought new perspectives and technology into British tank development. 
Additionally, the usual cycle of observing shortcomings in existing models and seeking improvements played a crucial role. The new tanks weren't brought in overnight, and refinements to earlier models continued to be made in the meantime. For example, the Crusader remained in frontline service until 1942, a whole two years after the catastrophic defeat in France, with a new version, the Crusader III, being introduced as late as May 1942, only to be replaced in frontline service by American M3 grants that began arriving a few months later. And note also, just the sake of pedantry, that earlier designs remained in service right till the end of the war if one includes theatres of lesser priority. But in real terms, these designs had gone by the close of the war. Among this general improvement of tanks throughout the war, one in particular stands out. Cannons, which, as we have seen, got bigger across the board. But why? It was the result of design Ouroboros. Nations improved armor to better stand up to the cannons of the day, which in turn warranted the installation of bigger cannons to defeat that armor, which then recreated the need for thicker armor to resist the new cannons, and so on and so forth. And when we say they got bigger, we are specifically referring to a couple of measurements, the length and the diameter, or the bore of their barrel. Naturally, the rest of the cannon, its mount and traversing gears, etc., also got bigger, but these were just supplementary, so don't stress too much about that. Lengthening the barrel was all about increasing the speed of the shell coming out of the business end. A longer barrel meant that the propellant gases generated during ignition could act on the shell for longer and thus pushed it out of the barrel at a greater velocity. This increased velocity then meant that the shell hit its target with a greater kinetic energy and therefore could punch through more armor. Widening the bore diameter of tank cannons was done to allow for heavier shells. A wider shell will naturally be heavier and thus have more kinetic impact when it impacts an enemy tank. Furthermore, it also contributes to its momentum, enhancing its ability to maintain velocity over distance and thus affording more accuracy. We've already looked at how the Soviets and Germans enlarged their cannons throughout the war, but now, to get across that this really was a universal process, let's now look at the other major combatants. For the UK, it started the war with a 40mm Ordnance QF2 pounder reigning supreme, with its being fitted to most of its tanks at the time, including the Matilda II, Valentine, and Crusader. By the end of the war, the 75mm Ordnance QF was in vogue, uh, with the type being standard in the Cromwell and Churchill. They also tried to squeeze the even larger 76.2mm Ordnance QF-17 pounder into tanks when possible, with this type being fitted to the Achilles and the Sherman Firefly, the latter famously being the bane of tigers in Normandy. For the US, it went into the war with the 37mm M5 as its mainstay, which was fitted to the M2 light tank, the only tank they really had at the onset of hostilities. By the end of the war, it had been replaced by the 75mm M3, which was standard on both the Sherman and Chaffee, and the 76mm M1, which was standard on the Hellcat and supplementarily fitted to some Shermans. And for Japan, it started the war with the 57mm Type 97 being its go-to, with the cannon being fitted as standard to the Type 97 Shiha. Late war, their tank development laxed as the nation's situation started to go belly up, but their prototype projects showed the direction they were thinking, with both the Type 4 Chi To and Type 5 Chi Ri being planned to use the 75mm Type 5 cannon. Tank cannons ended up hitting an upper limit of how big they could get, typically around 75 to 85 millimeters for medium tanks and 88 to 120 millimeters for heavy tanks. Designers wanted to go bigger, of course, but found themselves limited by what the chassis of the day could accommodate. For example, the Soviets attempted to push the envelope and squeeze a 100 millimeter LB-1 cannon into the venerable T-34. This would have made it an absolute monster, but even with a specially made turret, it was no good. The interwar design turret ring just couldn't take it, and it shattered time and time again during testing, and thus, with the constraints of war not allowing for a complete redesign of the chassis, the idea was shelved, and the T-34 had to make do with its 85mm cannon. As for the armor these cannons were designed to defeat, it improved in multiple ways. The first was simply the thickness of it. Early war tanks, particularly light ones, had very thin armor, with Panzer I's plate thickness only being 13mm at its greatest point, barely enough to resist concentrated machine gun fire. The meteor early war stuff, such as the Matilda II, a tank designed specifically to take a kicking as it crawled along in support of infantry, only had 60mm of plate at its thickest point. By the end of the war, the German Tiger II boasted 185mm of steel at its thickest point, and the Churchill 152mm. Sloped armor also came into its own in World War II. Literally, armor, which is tilted on a slope, it's right there in the name, it works by increasing the plate's effective thickness. Imagine a plate of steel, which is 10mm thick, 
Picture it being stood upright at 90 degrees. If you were to horizontally measure its thickness, it would only be 100 millimeters end to end. Pretty obvious. But now, if you were to tilt it at 45 degrees and measure again, you'd find that there would now be 200 millimeters of steel along the horizontal axis. Simply by tilting it a bit, you've gotten more thickness from the same piece of metal. A few tanks employed such armor before the war, such as the Swedish L-60 in the interwar years and the CA-1 all the way back in World War I. But designers of the time struggled to appreciate the real utility of such armor, and thus it stayed as an oddity, only featured on the odd tank here and there, either by accident or by design. By World War II, however, there was no doubt about the utility of such armor, and designs featuring it began to appear thick and fast, with examples including the T-34, which used a 45-degree angle to turn 45 millimeters of front plate on the original T-34-76 model, and 60 millimeters of plate on the later T-34-85, into 90 millimeters and 120 millimeters respectively, and the Panther, which used a 55-degree angle to turn 80 millimeters of front plate armor into 139.5 millimeters. Another armor improvement of the war was the development of spaced armor. A secondary armor system that added additional detached plates over the top of pre-existing armor, spaced armor proved exceptional at defeating high explosive anti-tank or heat shells. These are rounds that collapse a metal liner inside the shell into a superheated jet that melts right through armor and then delivers a high explosive into that hole to cause real damage. Spaced armor defeated these by navigating the effects of the superheated jet, which would only burn through the additional armor, leaving the high explosive charge to explode, usually harmlessly, against the tank's main armor. It was primarily a German innovation, with the Panzer IV, Panther, and Tigers I and II using it extensively later in the war. The Allies tinkered with its use here and there, with some Shermans and T-34s being fitted with it, but its use by the Allies ultimately remained an oddity. And as we've just discussed heat shells, let's now move on to talk about the range of advanced shells that came into use during the war. Going into the war, you had simple things like the high explosives HE shells that would simply slam into a target and blow up. While certainly tankies of the time didn't relish the prospect of being hit by one of these, being hit by one was typically no grave concern, usually messing up the barrel, shredding a track or two, but otherwise leaving most of the tank and crew inside okay. Their lethality came purely from the explosive mass generated on contact, and this was rarely enough to penetrate armor and cause any meaningful damage unless it was really, really big. As in the 152mm cannon of a KV-2 being fired against a Panzer IV big. Then there were the armor-piercing, or AP, shells. They were designed not to explode on impact, but to penetrate armor using their kinetic energy, which was focused on the shortened point of the shell that impacted the enemy tank first. AP shells did their job adequately in their time, but they lacked a certain lethality in World War II. I mean, great, you've punched a hole in the enemy tank, now when does it blow up? Boffins the world over sought the answer to that question as the war progressed, and thus a number of advanced new shells were developed. This includes armor-piercing discarding sabot, or APDS shells, which consisted of a small, dense penetrator, often made of tungsten, encased within a larger, lighter sabot, a sleeve. When fired, the sabot hugged the barrel to make sure the maximum amount of gas pushed on the shell. Then once the rounds left the barrel, the sabot was discarded, allowing the small penetrator to continue toward the target at a higher velocity due to its lower drag and greater mass-to-area ratio. This high velocity, combined with the penetrator's density and streamlined design, made them excellent at penetrating armor. And then there was the high explosive squash head, or HESS shells, which consisted of a plastic explosive casing rigged up to a delayed fuse. Upon striking the target, the explosive would spread out across the surface of the armor and then detonate. This detonation would then create a shockwave that traveled through the armor, causing spalling, tiny splinters of the armor's inner surface, which would then be propelled into the crew and important parts of the tank by the force of the shockwave. Incidentally, because of this unique design, HESS rounds had no drop in effectiveness with distance. If they hit, they'd cause the same damage, whether the target was two yards away or 2,000 yards away. And finally, there were armor-piercing composite rigid shells. These featured a dense hard core, often made of tungsten or another heavy metal encased in a lighter, softer metal jacket. The design principle behind APCR shells was to maximize the kinetic energy and penetration power at the point of impact. When fired, the heavier, smaller core retains high velocity due to its higher density and lower air resistance. 
Upon striking the target, the dense core concentrated its kinetic energy into a small area, enabling it to penetrate thick armor more effectively than standard AP rounds. The outer jacket, being lighter, helped in accelerating the projectile to a higher velocity, but often shattered upon impact, leaving the penetrator to do its job. Thus, as a result of the myriad of innovations that we've discussed, by the close of World War II, the tank was a very different beast to what it was at the start. The eclectic mix of tanks of equally varied quality that went into the war had been replaced by a streamlined roster of significantly more capable machines that were faster, tougher, deadlier, and incorporated radically more advanced technologies into their designs. So where would the tank go from here? Certainly, as World War II came to a close and was replaced by the ever-present spectre of imminent doom that was the Cold War, there was no shortage of reasons to continue to innovate and improve tanks. So now, let's bring this chapter to a close and go on to look at what came next. Cold War tank design was defined by the rise of the main battle tank, the MBT concept. MBTs aim to combine the best attributes of the previously separate classes of tanks into a single, universal platform. This innovative approach was driven by a threefold rationale. Firstly, by standardizing on a single tank model, military forces could ease logistical strains on the battlefield, simplifying maintenance, repair, and resupply processes, crucial for ensuring that armored units remained operational and effective over prolonged periods of combat or during rapid deployments. Secondly, it'd be more cost-effective. The economies of scale achieved through mass production of a standardized design would help to reduce unit costs, making it a financially prudent choice for defense budgets that already were stretched by the demands of the Cold War arms race. Thirdly, the MBT would provide armed forces with a versatile tool, capable of performing a variety of roles on the battlefield. This adaptability meant that the same tank could be used for different missions, from direct combat and breakthrough operations to reconnaissance and support roles. The result was a more flexible and responsive armored force, better equipped to handle the unpredictable and dynamic nature of modern warfare. The idea of an MBT began to crystallize during World War II. The medium tank had increasingly become the go-to tank type, as they were well armored enough to take on tanks, infantry, and fortifications alike. They were fast enough to remain flexible on the tactical level, and they were heavy enough to take a bit of a kicking. But still, they were far from universal and often had to be supplemented by light tanks for scouting and reconnaissance duties, heavy tanks for combat, and themselves divided into the specialist categories we discussed earlier, such as infantry support and tank destroyer. Thus, as the war progressed, tank designers naturally tried to squeeze more capabilities out of their medium tanks, leading to a generation of proto-MBTs being created before the war was out, including types such as the Panther and Sherman Firefly, which we've already met, as well as American M26 Pershing and Soviet T-44s. But they were still just a bit too vulnerable, and their guns just a bit too weak to truly be do-it-all tanks. The first true MBT would come in 1945, right on the tail end of World War II in the form of the British Centurion, or as they called it, the Universal Tank. The Centurion's design was a perfect balance of firepower, protection, and mobility. The initial models were equipped with the powerful QF-17 Pounder, but as better alternatives became available, this was eventually swapped out with the 84mm QF-20 Pounder and then the 105mm L7. Then. There was its armor. Taking cues from the sloped armor designs of Soviet and German tanks, the Centurion featured thick, well-angled plates. This combined with a robust suspension system and a powerful engine ensured that the Centurion was as agile as it was tough, capable of traversing challenging terrains while shrugging off enemy fire. It was a winning formula, too. In the Korean War, despite its hefty 50-ton frame and the challenging mountainous terrains of the theater, the Centurion tank showcased unparalleled agility and combat prowess, earning a dependable reputation among its crew and a fearsome one from its enemies. No better was this demonstrated by the Centurions, operated by the 8th King's Royal Irish Hussars, who, during the Battle of Happy Valley in 1951, delivered devastating firepower onto Chinese forces, shook off numerous rounds that would have taken out Shermans and Churchills, and thus facilitated the evacuation of beleaguered British troops and the building of a formidable defensive line around them, bringing victory. This was also the first time in the entire war the formidable Chinese army had been halted, and it was all thanks to the Centurion. But while the Centurion might have been the first MBT, other nations were quick to catch up. The Soviets had the T-54. It boasted impressive firepower thanks to its 100mm D-10 cannon and had thick armor and excellent mobility. Thanks to this, 
and the fact that the Soviets gave out the plans like candy at Halloween, the T-54 series is the most heavily produced tank in history by a country mile, with over 100,000 having rolled off the production line in the last 80 years. It is also probably the most heavily deployed tank in history too, having seen combat in far more wars than we could possibly list here. You basically think of a war that's happened since 1945, there was probably at least one T-54 derivative knocking about in that war somewhere. For the Americans, their first MBT was the M48 Patton. It represented a significant leap forward for the nation, boasting superior armor protection, firepower, and mobility compared to its predecessors. Its main armament, a small but still capable 90mm M41 cannon, was complemented by a well-designed turret and a powerful engine, ensuring that it could hold its own in a variety of combat situations. The tank quickly gained a reputation for reliability and effectiveness, seeing extensive service in the Cold War era and proving to be adaptable to numerous upgrades and modifications. Tanks such as these are jointly referred to as first-generation MBTs. The second generation would have begin emerging in the 1960s and are distinct from the first generation for their enhanced night fighting capabilities and incorporation of nuclear, biological, and chemical or NBC protection. They also typically featured greater speed, greater protection, and greater firepower. One example of a second-generation MBT is the British Chieftain, introduced in 1966 to replace the Centurion. It featured heavy armor and powerful 120mm L115 cannon, making it easily one of the most formidable tanks of its era. It was also notable for its reclined driver position, which allowed the heavily sloped hull fronts, which enhanced its defensive capabilities by both the natural qualities of sloped armor that we already discussed, and allowing the whole tank to sit much lower than it would have done with upright positions, thus making it harder to hit. The Soviet Union's first second-gen MBT was the T-62, introduced in 1961. It was a tank that capitalized on the successful features of its predecessor while incorporating a larger 115mm U5TS cannon. This cannon was notable for being smoothbore, meaning it had no rifling, literally its bore was smooth. The third generation of MBTs began to emerge in the 70s and 80s, and they typically are defined by the incorporation of computer-stabilized fire control systems, which allow firing on the move as well as very high first hit probability on targets up to 2,000 meters away, as well as further innovations in armor material and design. An example of a third-gen MBT would be the M1 Abrams, introduced by the US in 1980. With advanced composite armor and a powerful 105mm M68 cannon, itself a derivative of the British L7 cannon, the Abrams set a new standard for tank design among NATO powers. One of the M1's most unique features is its use of a gas turbine engine. Such an engine, similar in operation to those found in jet aircraft, provide a high power-to-weight ratio, granting the Abrams exceptional speed and agility on the battlefield. This type of engine is also remarkably smooth and quiet in comparison to traditional engines, which can be advantageous for stealth and crew comfort. However, gas turbine engines tend to have higher fuel consumption and can be less efficient at lower speeds, so its advantages did come at a cost. Also of note is the South Korean K-1 introduced in 1987. This was the nation's first foray into advanced tank design. It incorporated technologies from both American and European designs, all built vaguely on the platform of the Abrams. It also shared the same cannon as the Abrams, utilizing an M68. The evolution of tanks during this period could be a whole video in and of itself. But for now, let's keep this simple by summing it up like this. The first gen was all about getting the do-it-all concept nailed. The second gen prepped them for nuclear war with the NBC capabilities, and the third gen brought in all the posh computers that allowed them to land kills from really far away. And across the generations, the tanks typically got a bit faster, a bit tougher, and just a bit meaner. So, now that we have the basic grounding in the evolution of Cold War MBTs and to become acquainted with a few examples, let's dive into the more relevant technological innovations and explore them in greater depth, starting with the armor. Up until this chapter, we didn't really have much to talk about when it came to armor, beyond the introduction of sloped armor, the steel just got thicker and better forged over time. But that changed big time during the Cold War, because now, as we saw on the Abrams, steel was out and composite armor was in. In a nutshell, composite armor is armor that, rather than being pure steel, is made of layers of different materials such as ceramics, plastics, rubbers, and good old-fashioned steel. Quite literally, armor which is a composite of different materials. 
Each of these materials provides different defensive qualities. Steel, for example, is about pure strength to resist oncoming projectiles, and ceramic is about dissipating and defeating the heat of specialized anti-tank munitions. Together, these materials act as a sum greater than their parts and allow for armor that can resist a plethora of different projectiles. The first tank to use such armor was the Soviet T-64, which was introduced in 1966 and used what the Soviets called K-Formula armor, and from then, composite armor spread worldwide, with another notable example being Chobham armor, which was fitted to British Challenger 1 and 2s as well as on the Abrams. Now, very little is known about this armor, but from the odd nugget of information that has been released here and there, we know that it utilizes layers of ceramic tiles encased in a metal matrix. It's bonded to a backing plate and has several elastic layers permeating it. Next, let's look at the cannons. We've already seen that they got bigger during the Cold War, the benefits of which we covered in the last chapter, so we're not going to retread that, but we shall look at the adoption of smooth bore designs. Now, we hinted at this when we introduced the T-62, but what we didn't mention was the adoption of such guns was pretty much universal in the later Cold War. Now, you might be wondering, well, why? After all, wouldn't this be a huge step back? A rifled cannon with its ability to impart spin on a projectile is surely going to be more accurate, right? It's what gives. Well, the answer, in a nutshell, is the fancy new shells were developed that couldn't really be fired out of rifled barrels, not easily anyway, and so a loss of accuracy was determined to be a worthy trade-off in order to use them. An example of such a round would be an armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabot. These used a dense penetrator core, often made of depleted uranium or tungsten, to punch through enemy armor. Think like a World War II-era APDS rounds, but even faster and even harder hitting, and stabilized by fins to help compensate for the lack of spin in accuracy. Smoothbore cannons could be used to fire anti-tank guided missiles, ATGMs, although this was more of a Soviet communist bloc thing. This was a genius move, really. Tanks equipped with such capabilities, such as the T-64 and T-80, could use ATGMs to both reach out to distances that normal projectiles simply couldn't reach and guide them down onto the thin top armor of enemy tanks. Fortunately, at least, the consideration of pros and cons of rifle versus smoothbore cannons wasn't something that had eat away at tank designers for very long, because with the widespread adoption of computer-assisted fire control systems and the third generation of MBTs, accuracy of smoothbore munitions was no longer a concern. To sum this tech up, imagine a boffin sat on the knee of a tanky, and as he shoves a new round into his tank breech, he furiously scribbles away with a pen and paper to figure out the distance to the target, the weather conditions, and how the latter will impact the round as it travels the former. And just before our hypothetical crewman pulls the trigger, it tells him exactly where he needs to point. Imagine that, but a computer, and you've got it. Sure, rifled rounds would still be more accurate, and using them, the computerized big brain could probably squeeze out a few more hundred yards of range, but all in all, problem solved. The job was a good one. The mobility of tanks also radically improved during the Cold War, thanks entirely to big new engines crammed with the latest tech and fancy new suspension systems. Now, we're not going to discuss the tech behind this in too much depth, because frankly, a discussion of the systems involved in engine power delivery would be just a tad bit dull, but we will discuss the results. Take the Centurion and the Patton. They could reach 22 and 30 miles per hour respectively, brisk in their day for sure, particularly considering the 50 or so ton weight of them. But come the end of the Cold War, tanks such as the Abrams and T-80, both of which had gas turbine engines, could reach 45 and 43 miles per hour respectively. This improvement wasn't just limited to gas turbine tanks either, as the conventionally powered Challenger 2 and K-1 topped out at 37 and 40 miles per hour respectively. Now, this might not sound like a lot, but don't think of it as tanks just gaining 20 miles per hour or so of speed. Think of it proportionally, in which case the tanks just doubled their speed, which is a huge deal on both the tactical and the strategic level. All right, so now that we have our overview of tanks from this period and they've explored some of their technologies in depth, let's now take a look at the different ways the capitalist and communist worlds designed their tanks. For NATO and the other Western powers, their tanks emphasized quality over quantity. Tanks like the Abrams, Challenger 1, and the German Leopard 2 encapsulated this philosophy. These were machines that both on paper and in practice had the edge in one-on-one -on -one encounters with their communist counterparts. 
Moreover, NATO tanks were designed with crew comfort and ergonomics in mind, which indirectly contributed to prolonged operational efficiency and crew effectiveness during battle scenarios. This isn't to say that the communist tanks were crude per se, as they were still by and large perfectly up to date and modern battle machines perfectly capable of contending with Western tanks, just that the communists tended to really scrimp on cutting edge tech and fancy toys. Take Night Vision, for example. With the Centurion Mark V that entered production in 1955, the British began using smaller and more compact infrared lamp systems. The Soviets, by comparison, continued using their bulky old Lunar IR system right through to the late 1970s. It was still a perfectly functional system, it was just cruder. But there were advantages to the communist way of doing things. For starters, it allowed them to make tanks in ludicrous quantities, producing 100,000 T-54s, 20,000 T-62s, 25,000 T-72s, compared to 4,500 Centurions, 12,000 Patterns, and 6,500 Leopard 1s. And sure, they were a bit cruder than their Western counterparts, but would you rather be in your own Centurion or in a squad of T-54s? The Soviets also worked their numerical advantage into their battle strategy, developing a concept known as Deep Battle, in which vast quantities of highly mobile armored spearheads, fully supported by aircraft, infantry, and a sophisticated logistics operation, would hit NATO forces in so many places that it simply became impossible to muster effective resistance before then focusing on destroying everything before them. They then moved to the next battle line and repeat until NATO had been driven back to the English Channel. Having the tanks be simpler also made them easier to maintain, ensuring a greater level of operational availability during a conflict and making them easier to be operated by replacement conscript crews who uh, would be likely to have minimal training should World War III kick off. Fortunately, World War III didn't break out, and the plains of Central Europe were spared from being reduced to a lifeless wasteland as they hosted history's greatest clash of armor. But this doesn't mean that we lack the means to fully assess the tanks of the era by their combat performance against one another, because in the many, many flashpoints of the Cold War, the tanks of the East and the West did indeed meet each other in combat, with there being no better example than the Gulf War. And yes, we know it's debatable whether or not the Gulf War is a Cold War conflict per se, but since it featured all the major tanks of the period slogging it out against each other in huge numbers, let's just go with it, shall we? The Abrams was undoubtedly the foremost tank of the conflict, both deadly and available in huge quantities. Dubbed Whispering Death by Iraqis due to its surprisingly quiet engine and able to destroy any Soviet-designed tank it came across thanks to its wealth of cutting-edge munitions that came out of the business end of its cannon, it was a truly terrifying prospect in the Levantine sands. But mighty though it was, it was far from the only tank the US sent into the fray with the Vietnam-era M551 Sheridan, a diddly little thing light enough to be transported en masse by air, actually being the first tank to cross the border and take aim at Iraqi armor. Also present was the M60, the last version of the old pattern fielded by the Marine Corps. Representing the British was the Challenger 1. Although available in lesser numbers thanks to the UK's modest approach to defense spending, it still performed fantastically pound for pound, destroying over 200 Iraqi tanks without a single loss to enemy fire and scoring the longest confirmed tank-on-tank -tank kill in history at a distance of just over three miles. The lighter, speed-focused AMX-30 MBT was also present, being fielded by French and Qatari forces, and it performed well, but too were lost to enemy fire, a testament to the fact that the sacrificing of armor in favor of mobility wasn't a worthwhile payoff. Opposing these diverse allied armament forces were T-72s, Iraq's primary tank, with additional numbers of T-54s and T-62s, as well as other odds and ends that Saddam had managed to scrape together over the years, including Yugoslavian M-84s and British chieftains. Now, as you may have already ascertained, their losses were catastrophic. Over 3,300 Iraqi tanks were destroyed in total, with most estimates placing the number destroyed by enemy tank fire at being around 30 to 40 percent of this figure. But while this may indicate a clear-cut victory for the Western model of quality over quantity, is such an assessment actually correct? Currently, an intense debate is raging in the historiography of the conflict, one in which one side argues that this one-sided decimation was due to the inferiority of Iraq's largely Soviet-derived tank force, and the other argues that it was a unique fluke of circumstance. Personally, 
It would probably come down more on the latter side. It must be remembered that prior to the beginning of the ground operation, the coalition forces had used overwhelming air superiority to dismantle Iraq's warfighting capabilities brick by brick. Many tanks had been destroyed, defensive infrastructure eviscerated, and command and control systems annihilated. And as a result, when the coalition tanks crossed the border, the Iraqi army was in total disarray, completely unable to enact any theater-wide counters, and resistance being organized at the local level by commanders using whatever they happened to have on hand at any given time. Given this, and the fact that the coalition forces had not far off the same number of shiny high-tech tanks as the Iraqis did utilitarian Soviet ones, is the Gulf War really testimony to the superiority of the Western design model, or is it just testimony to the fact that when the entire world gangs up on you to give you a good shoeing, your tanks are probably going to be just a little bit useless? With the falling of the wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union itself in 1991, we find ourselves at the modern day. The East versus West competitive dynamic that had driven tank design for the prior 50 years was now over. But this would not lead to a stagnation in tank technology, oh no, because while America, and by extension NATO, may have won their place at the top of the global hegemon, there are still threats aplenty to America's place in the world. Some, like China, stand poised to rip America's crown from its head and take it for itself, and others such as Russia or North Korea simply reject the US hegemon altogether and wish to conduct their affairs away from the interference of Uncle Sam. Consequently, as a result of this nebulous new world order, the threat of major conflict is still far from vanquished, and tanks have continued to improve in anticipation of it. The major design trend that we need to be aware of is the rise of 3.5 gen MBTs. These being MBTs that are slightly better than their Cold War counterparts, but not necessarily revolutionary enough to represent a whole new generation. They're also usually upgraded older designs rather than totally new ones. Uh, to see what this slight betterness actually means, let's now look at a few countries and see how they've improved their tanks. Starting with China. In short, they've been playing catch up. Despite being a major world power during the Cold War, they were rarely on the apex of military technology, with the bulk of their MBTs being outdated first and second gen models, most of which were either license built Soviet tanks or indigenous variants thereof. For example, the Type 59 was basically a T-55 with Chinese characters stamped over the Cyrillic, and similarly, the Type 69 was an upgraded and tinkered with Type 59 that had some tech inspired by the T-62 slapped on it. They did catch up quickly, however, producing the Type 98 and 99 at the turn of the millennium. These were still Soviet T-72s at their core, but thanks to actually bothering to put in the time to extensively redesign and modernize them, they were true third-gen MBTs and had very little in common with their Soviet predecessor besides the suspension system and the vague shape of the hull. China didn't rest on its laurels, however, because with other nations pushing out their 3.5 gen MBTs, there was still a lot of work to be done. This work was completed with the coming of the Type 99A in 2011. It features an advanced 125mm smoothbore ZPT-98 cannon, which is stabilized both horizontally and vertically, can fire all the advanced munitions that the Western nations can, and is capable of a rate of fire of 10 rounds a minute thanks to a new autoloader system. Its fire control systems include top-of-the-line thermal imaging, a ballistics computer, and weather adjustment sensors. For target identification incorporates the shiny new ST-16 Wave Radar Suite, a system that offers reliable all-weather and advanced identify friend foe capabilities. Its protection comes from a heavily angled design that incorporates space modular armor, composite panels, and top-of-the-line explosive reactive armor, which in total is equivalent to over 1,000 millimeters of traditional steel armor. Finally, it also includes extensive countermeasure systems, such as a JD-3 Laser Active Protection System (APS), capable of destroying enemy munitions before they hit. This, in a nutshell, is the benchmark of a 3.5 gen MBT. Nothing radical compared to the third gens of the last chapter, but just a bit better in lots of small ways. Other notable examples include the German Leopard 2 NG model, the Russian T-80BVM, and the Israeli Makava 4. As for how 3.5 gen MBTs fare in combat, well, let's have a look, shall we? Specifically at the Makava 4 and the T 80 BVM, two of the most heavily produced and deployed tanks of their generation. The Makava 4 was designed specifically for the unique military situation the Israeli military faces, namely heavy urban fighting in places such as the Gaza Strip. 
Combat such as this is a tanky's nightmare. Enemies can be enormous in number and can appear without warning from countless vantage points at a moment's notice. And thanks to the ample amount of elevated terrain in urban environments, it's nice and easy for them to get off shots with rocket launchers onto your vulnerable top armor. With this in mind, the Israelis spent their money sickening up the Makava's top armor and developing a top of the APS for it, which they dubbed the Trophy System. Trophy is intended to defeat rockets coming from all angles, and it appears to do this very well. The system got its trial by fire in 2011, when a Makava 4 station near the Gaza border successfully intercepted an incoming RPG-7 warhead fired by Hamas fighters attempting to ambush the tank. The system appeared to have a morale-crushing effect too, because when the attackers saw the tank suffer not so much as a scratch to its paintwork and then rapidly turn its barrel towards them, they made the prudent choice to beat a hasty retreat and have a go another day. Successes such as this continued to pile up as the years went on and left such a profound impact on Hamas's military leadership that come their preparations for their October 2023 attack into Israel, they disseminated flyers full of handy tips for defeating Trophy, the main one of which advised firing multiple rockets for distances of 50 yards or closer, the idea being not to give the system enough time to react and to totally overwhelm it so that at least some of the warheads make it to their target. Hamas fighters have given this tactic a jolly good go too and have uploaded many dozens of headcam videos of them attempting to swarm Makava 4s with rockets in the weeks prior to us making this video. The tactic seems ineffective, however. They land hits, sure, but the few that get through just don't do any damage. We didn't find a single example of a Makava 4 suffering a single penetrating hit, let alone being knocked out. These kinds of mass rocket attacks would have been fatal to third-gen MBTs lacking APS. Take the mighty Challenger 2. Sure, its armor is good, but with no APS, every single projectile aimed at it is going to hit, and eventually that incredible armor is going to buckle, as the Russians demonstrated in September 2023 when they managed to knock out the formerly invincible Challenger 2, destroying one in Ukraine through sheer brute force. As for the T-80 BVM, it doesn't appear to have fared nearly as well as the Makava 4. As the time of writing, 104 have been lost in Ukraine, with 70 being destroyed outright and 34 being damaged or captured. The reason for this is twofold. Firstly, the extensiveness of the tank's overhaul, and secondly, the opposition it has faced. On the first point, whereas the Makava 4 was upgraded to counter a very specific threat and had no expense spared during its upgrade, the T-80 BVM's upgrade was a bit of a blag. It was Russia turning around and saying, yeah, we can't really afford a posh new tank, so how about you just take one of these old ones and make it a bit less sh for as little money as possible, all right? As a result, sure, it's an improvement of the original T-80, but to compare it to the Macarver 4 is to compare apples to oranges. Evidencing this is the wrecks examined by Ukrainian forces. One T-80 BVM examined in June of 2023 revealed that it was using 1PN 96MT-02 thermal sights, a cheap and cheerful thing when its design documents indicated that it was meant to be equipped with the Sosna U system, a Belarusian model which is truly world-leading. So, in a nutshell then, modern 3.5 gen MBTs are as good as their budget. If, like China and Israel, you spare no expense in their construction and or upgrade, you end up with a tank which is among the best in the world. If, like Russia, you do it on the cheap, you end up with a tank that would be an absolute weapon during the Cold War, but that today is ultimately left lacking. Now, all of this talk of 3.5 Gen MBTs raises a question. If the ferocious Type 99A and Macarver 4 aren't good enough to be considered 4th Gen, then what is? Well, to answer that, let's bring this chapter to a close and have a look at what the future holds. What exactly fourth generation MBTs will be is very much unsettled. At present, only two have reached active service the Japanese Type 10 and the South Korean K2 Black Panther, with there also possibly being a further two in the form of the Russian T 14 Amata and North Korean M2020, but take those ones with a pinch of salt due to the lack of information available about them. As a result of the small number that have reached service, it is difficult for us to pick out distinct design trends that may come to define the generation. But let's do what we can by delving deep into an MBT that everyone agrees will define the fourth generation to come, the upcoming British Challenger 3. Through the Challenger 3, we see that what we can expect to see is the same evolution that we have seen since the very beginning of MBTs. Some new technologies that will radically change things and everything else being upgraded just to be a bit better. For Firepower, the Challenger 3 is confirmed as using a 120mm L55A1 smoothbore cannon that will be complemented by programmable ammunition. 
literally. The ammunition that the tank's firing computer can tinker with as it leaves the barrel for more optimal results. This is naturally a huge step up compared to the MBTs of old, but an even bigger step up compared to the Challenger II specifically, as the British were one of the few nations to cling to rifled cannons as smoothbore came into vogue, insistent that their hash rounds were so good that they were worth keeping a rifle barrel to make full use of. Furthermore, this new cannon will be hooked up to dual independent thermal images and a fully integrated system for automatic target tracking, a substantial upgrade over the single thermal imager of the Challenger 2 that lacked any automatic tracking capabilities. In terms of armor, the Challenger 3 will be chucking Chobram armor in the bin in favor of Farnham armor, a brand new composite formulation that is so good that they won't tell us what it's made of or what it can do. On top of this will be mounted a new Epsom armored system. Again, we have no idea what this actually is, only that it's meant to be modular, easily replaceable, and go on top of the Farnham armor plates to provide an even greater level of protection. The Challenger will also finally be joining the APS club, as it will also be getting the same trophy APS as the Macarver 4 that we discussed in the last chapter. As much as it is annoying that we can't go into specific details, we still have enough information to tell that the Challenger 3 will be a very hard tank to kill. When it comes to speed, we don't know. Ryan Matar BAE Systems Land, the designer of the Challenger 3, reassure us that it'll be faster and more maneuverable than ever, but won't tell us any hard figures. So I guess we'll just have to go with that. I mean, it'll be faster. That's all the information we've got. But the real game changer would appear to be the digitization of the Challenger 3's communication systems. Back in the distant days of the last chapter, tank communication was primitive to say the least. Some dial which looked like it was ripped straight out of the 1950s would display some important information which then had to be interpreted and shouted down the radio to someone who would then have to shout it down their radio to someone important who would then decide what to do and pass their verdict back down the communication chain. This naturally made tactical communication a little bit clunky, and decisions that could do with being made in seconds could end up taking minutes. But with the Challenger 3, gone is that clunky way of doing things. It will seamlessly integrate data sharing technologies so that it can instantly communicate data with other units, be they a fellow tank 10 feet beside it, or through space and back down to a commander sat on the other side of the world. The difference this will make to the battlefield can't be overstated. The tank beside you knows exactly what you're looking at and how you are doing and can plan accordingly. And the theater commander knows exactly what you're doing as you do it and thus can plan and direct accordingly. Unfortunately, while digitized communication systems certainly appear revolutionary and all new MBTs will be implementing them to varying degrees, it doesn't appear to be a defining characteristic of the fourth generation as different countries have highlighted other features as being the revolutionary ones. So to try and get to the bottom of this, let's look at a few more examples, starting with the Type 10. The Japanese appear to have been a bit more old school with the Type 10, as rather than putting the emphasis on anything new that makes it revolutionary, press releases from the JSDF mostly emphasize the cannon and armor as its defining features, pointing out how its autoloader with a mere 3.5 second reload time halves the time of autoloaders of previous generations, as well as the fully modular nature of its armor, which they boast makes it near invincible in any theater. Annoyingly, like the British, they keep their clouds close to their chests, so so there are many details we can give about how these systems actually work, but if we take them at their word, they certainly seem to be enormous improvements. The South Koreans take a similar approach with their K2, choosing to define its fourth generationness by its greatly improved traditional systems rather than brand new technology and advanced features. Specifically, they boast about the engine, which annoyingly they don't tell us much about, but they do reassure us that it's really good, and its suspension, which uses a hydro-pneumatic system to make its ride height adjustable and thus be able to traverse any sort of terrain with ease, is also present. So what can we take away from all of that about the defining features of 4th gen MBTs? Well, in a nutshell, nothing. With so little consensus among their operators about what features makes them so revolutionary, we'll just have to wait and see what the cold, hard reality of battle decides.